Some people do it for the nobility of it, and God bless them for coming forth and helping the system. But there's also an economic incentive attached to a whistleblower who blows the whistle the right way. And why not try to partake in that upside as well if you're going to do the right thing? Could you possibly be a witness to health care fraud and maybe not even know it? Maybe you have a whistleblower case. Well, we're going to find out right now because that's what we're going to ask the lawyer on this episode. Hi again, everybody. I'm Rob Rosenthal with AskTheLawyers.com. And my guest here to answer all of our questions is New Jersey attorney Jason Brown. I want to remind you, if you have questions about your specific situation, just head over to AskTheLawyers.com. Click the little button at the top of the screen that says Ask a Lawyer, and you can do all your asking right there. But right now, it's my turn. Jason, it's always good to see you. Thank you for making some time to answer our questions. Great to see you this morning. Thank you. So when we talk about health care fraud, that's a pretty big umbrella, isn't it? That covers a lot of different things. And specifically for our conversation, we're talking about defrauding the federal government, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a very broad conversation because it is fraud to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars a year when you talk about defrauding the federal government. But when you talk about also add into the mix defrauding private insurance, uh -huh. the number probably reaches a trillion dollars. And if you're not ticked off, you should be, because this type of fraud winds up hurting everybody. It hurts you as a taxpayer because your taxes go up when the federal government's defrauded, and it hurts you when you have health care insurance because your premiums go up as a result of all this fraud. Wow. Is, is it possible, in your experience, because you've had a lot of experience with this, uh, that some people might be aware of, 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 one of, of this fraud, but maybe not, a, maybe not even realize it, or, or am I being naive? No, I mean, people don't even know what they know. And it, it is an interesting tension about what goes on because there's all different types of fraud. And some of the fraud is so prevalent and incestuous that they just think it's the new normal. So therefore, it's normal and not illegal. But I could run through like one prevalent example of something known as kickbacks. And in the kickback paradigm, what happens is uh, people pay or healthcare providers pay to get Medicare or Medicaid patients funneled in their direction. Okay. But inside the institution, they may think this is normal. If they pay a doctor that's outside their practice money to get the Medicaid, that might be what everybody's doing. They don't think there's anything wrong. But under the federal guidelines, there is something deeply wrong with that. Hmm. What are some of the other areas in layman's terms that, that uh, constitute healthcare fraud? There, there's a variety of them, and there's no really shortage, depending upon how innovative the dirty doctor or medical practice is. Uh, there's upcoding. Upcoding involves when somebody, for example, is there for a 15-minute visit, but the healthcare practitioner puts in for a 30-minute visit. Services not provided, that's an easy one. Mm -hmm. Person comes in for uh, one procedure, but the doctor bills Medicare or Medicaid for multiple procedures that weren't performed. Ghosting patients. Uh, th these are phantoms, but there's some real money that's attached to these phantoms. And what happens with ghosting patients is an actual person may show up once a month, but the healthcare practitioner bills them two or three times a month. Oh. One of the huge areas that sometimes is a billion dollar claim by itself is pharmaceutical fraud. And that could happen in a few ways. Uh, there is when they go for approval of a product, big pharma generally, if they falsify the FDA results and the studies to get a product approved, that's a big no-no. If they lie about the efficacy of a product. So, for example, if there's a case involving a product that the pharmaceutical company knows is inert or does not work, that could be a huge pharmaceutical case. Hmm. Uh, Off-label marketing. In the past, for example, let's use Propecia as an example, although I'm not saying anything was wrong legally with the Propecia right. marketing. Uh, Propecia was supposed to be used to treat by benign prostate enlargement, but the off-label promotion was for uh, hair, hair loss right. and hair growing. Not that I know anything about that one way or the other. Uh, <laughs> but if the, you're telling the federal government you've been approved for A, the, the, the prostate usage, but then sell it to the federal government and everybody else for B, for the hair loss part, you may have a big ketam type of case. Uh, unnecessary tests particularly in the context of what's going on right now with the virus that unfortunately we're all plagued right. and have to face. Uh, you may come in for the virus and they may decide, hey, we'll also test you for STDs, even though there's no necessary correlation. Hmm. So there's really no shortage of false scams the healthcare practitioners engage in 
in order to overbill the federal government and you, the taxpayer. In your experience, Jason, is there one type of person, is there a usual type of person who ends up being the whistleblower? Is it the person in charge of billing or, or coding or, or is it run the gamut? It can run the gamut, although individuals that tend to fare better in this type of litigation are individuals who have inside information about systemic fraud. So that could be a coder or a biller or a doctor, but it could be anybody, a receptionist potentially, that knows that there's a scam going on. And the key is not necessarily understanding the entirety of the scam, mm -hmm. but knowing where to go and who to ask the right questions to so you can tease out and flush out the fact pattern and find out if you may potentially be exposing a fraud. And the way it goes with the KETAM under the False Claims Act is the fraud isn't exposed immediately. Oftentimes, after you consult a whistleblower lawyer or a whistleblower law firm, it's years, years before the defendant finds out that there's an active investigation into their conduct because the case is filed confidentially mm -hmm. under seal. And uh, we mentioned this often, but I think it's worth mentioning you talked about knowing where to go. Um, if someone thinks that they are, uh, have knowledge of wrongdoing, they need to talk to someone like you first before they go and confront somebody or, or call the HR helpline or any of that stuff. They need to talk to an attorney first, right? Absolutely. They need to speak to a whistleblower lawyer first. I think we try to talk every month, and we certainly appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you. And we talk about it all the time. And in the last period since we talked, we had two individuals that came to us that internally reported the matter. One was fired a week later. Wow. One was fired within an hour Whoa. after internally reporting through the company uh, internal mechanisms, which allegedly are supposed to have no reprisals. Right. That's why you should speak with a professional, even if it's not our firm, to speak with somebody who focuses on protecting whistleblowers like our firm, and they'll go over your options and potential consequences for reporting it through the internal reporting mechanisms. Also, if you report it to the government in the wrong way, you may have all the downside and none of the upside. Right. And what I mean by that is your identity may eventually be disclosed to the defendant, but you may not be able to partake in any recovery. And you know, some people do it for the nobility of it, and God bless them for coming forth and helping the system. But there's also an economic incentive attached to a whistleblower who blows the whistle the right way. And why not try to partake in that upside as well if you're going to do the right thing? Well, let's talk about that a little uh, quickly. There is, besides the, I did the right thing and I can pat myself on the back, there can be a monetary reward for the whistleblower. Tell us about that. It, it could be quite hefty. And when we talked about healthcare fraud uh, being in the billions each year, Every year under the False Claims Act, between 2 to $3 billion are recovered, and whistleblowers under that statute alone could obtain up to 30%. So that's almost $900 million a year available to the whistleblower under the False Claims alone. And that's the Federal False Claims Act. Right. Add in the fact that there's other statutes that a skillful firm may be able to navigate into, such as the uh, Illinois Private Insurance Act and the California Private Insurance Act, where you can get up to 50% of what the government recovers. Hmm. So if you have the right information and you steer that information to the right firm, they're going to look for ways to, number one, better society by addressing the issue, but number two, protecting you as, as the client and trying to maximize your potential for recovery. Does someone need to be prepared to pay out of pocket to come up with some money to talk to you to even find out if they have a case, Jason? With our firm, not at all. With, with our firm, we offer free confidential consultations across the country about various whistleblower matters. And also, most of the time, we take the case, if, strike that, if we take the case, we're not paid unless we win the case. So we may spend tens of thousands of dollars litigating, flying out uh, once air flight happens once right. again. And assuming the case goes south, the individual does not owe us a dime. We only get paid if we win, and we like to win. Lots of great information. Always an interesting talk, Jason. It's good to see you again. Thank you for making some time for us. Thank you very much for having me. That's going to do it for this episode of Ask the Lawyer. My guest has been New Jersey attorney Jason Brown. Remember, if you have questions about your specific situation, head over to askthelawyers.com. Click the button at the top of the page that says Ask a Lawyer, and it'll walk you right through the process there. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm Rob Rosenthal with Ask the Lawyers.